For years, I've been wandering, nonstop, day and night, searching for just one show that could have everything you'd ever want. Lady cults, coyote men, needless wave warp shots, intense parental issues, vampire imagery, printer business dynamics, unrealistically good masks, and a surprising amount of businessmen running around and doing flips. Just when I'd given up hope of ever seeing that, a friend came to me and said, hey, somebody translated and posted this old Japanese show onto the obscure media subreddit, and it sounds really, really weird, so obviously we should watch it. And this is how it starts. Love Complex is a Japanese television drama from 2000 that, for a long time, only had very imperfect English versions floating around, whether online, on Chinese DVDs, or apparently it also aired on the International Channel in the US in 2001. I wasn't able to find confirmation of that one, but the guy who translated all this Japanese and is thus able to effectively search for way more info on the show claims that, so I don't doubt it. Point is, not a lot of people had their eyes on this show since then, and it was largely fading away to time, but now that the internet has an up version with a fresh translation, it's slightly more known. The show is sort of about two guys investigating an embezzlement case at an electronics company, and it's one of the greatest enigmas I've ever seen with my own eyes. Series creator Ryoichi Kimizuka, after having worked on dramas all throughout the 90s, wrote it specifically to go hard against the grain of the stale landscape of these shows, likely being them unapologetically following whatever romance trends are popular at that point. And from that, it's important to note that it means Love Complex is, at the very least, decently self-aware, yet it's so implausibly strange in its directing, music, plot, that it succeeds at making you question that. You feel like this level of absurdity can't be faked without being transparent. Like how people say you can't make the room on purpose. Its incompetence only works due to the sincerity balancing it out. And they're right, you can't do that on purpose. Love Complex isn't a the room. It's well acted, if quite over the top, and has its own legitimate strengths. But it does walk another tricky line where there's a lot it doesn't explain, intense tonal clashes are all over the place, yet so often the characters just keep this straight face and you wonder, how serious is this supposed to be? Very much in that David Lynch vein of Blue Velvet, Wild at Heart era, where characters are always either intensely, intensely emotional or completely straight faced, with obviously Twin Peaks also being a big influence down to the main vehicle for the story being a mystery but solving it not necessarily being the story's focus. And for as much as David Lynch's work is, in many, many ways, better than Love Complex, in some ways I'm more impressed by Ryoichi remotely pulling something like that off, because the style wasn't already established as in his wheelhouse the way it always was with Lynch. Like, to gain a bit more perspective on J-dramas in general, and see more of what is unusual about Love Complex in Japan, versus only comparing it to American TV, I watched the first episode of a handful of series, a few of which had some sort of relation to Love Complex, like being what took over its time slot after finishing, or being the very next series that Ryoichi wrote. And that series, Goodbye Mr. Ozu, is totally normal, night and day. It was patient, competently shot, character-focused, thoughtful. These shows have the same father, yet there is no shared DNA between them. So I am endlessly fascinated by this as an isolated show, and I don't know how anyone wouldn't be after seeing the first episode. We get that window scene of our main character falling to the ground, turning to the camera, and then saying, Sayonara. Like how most shows begin, before jumping back way earlier to get a proper lay of the land, setting up the actual plot, which is that at this electronics company, someone embezzled 9 million yen from the company. And the secretaries in this one department are all suspects because they handle deposits and withdrawals, and the executives there didn't even know how to use computers. The director doesn't want word of this to get out because it's bad press, so instead of involving police, he just hires two new guys to both run the department and solve this case. So these guys, Shinyoji and his superior, Chief Ryuzaki, respectively, are suspicious of these women who, despite not all being aware of the investigation they're doing, are suspicious and hateful towards them in turn. They all have this adversarial dynamic while also needing to work together with the general business side of their work, 
as they often get sucked into side quests based around pleasing other higher-up executives. Like in the first episode, one executive had a medical emergency while he was off having an affair, and Shinyoji and Ryozaki had to cover it up from his wife. They end up needing the secretary's help, who say if they do this, Ryozaki needs to transfer out. So they save the day, and that agreement is honored. He transfers to a different company, and leaves Shinyoji to run that department and solve the case entirely on his own for the rest of the series. Except that doesn't happen, Ryozaki just breaks his promise and says, So, uh, yeah. It only seems more unhinged as you look at each deeper layer of the episode. Like for established characterizations, Ryuzaki speaks for himself there. He's both controlling and uncontrollable. He's sexist. He promises women promotions in order to get information and or sleep with them. He also punches Shinyoji in the stomach when they first meet and grabs his balls way too much. Shinyoji is maybe sorta of normal. At least one of the most sensible people here, though he has his own weird issues with his mom, who always, always, always has a huge dinner laid out for the two of them when he gets home. Renjo, the younger secretary, has a specific spot on the wall of the break room that she likes to punch. Hiragi goes to a cult, and the head secretary, Arase, is constantly shown with this cold, dead stare, and she has a strange interest in watching this one building be destroyed, the sound of which is apparently being replayed constantly in her head. There are others, we'll get to them. Shit. The editing is like, made for YouTube, ahead of its time, clearly. At so many points, it feels like that Mr. Beast mold of, we can't go three whole seconds of a simple shot without cutting, zooming, or adding in some other visual effect, that, that, that'd just be crazy. They'll use the camera in every possible way, switch shots constantly, repeat a scene three times for dramatic effect, and use sounds like whatever this is. And as we'll see, a lot of the time they'll find a new editing trick and decide, this is the thing this episode. We'll use it a bunch here, and when the episode ends, we'll never use it again. Consistent inconsistency. And lastly, there's all these little things that just don't make sense. When Shinyoji first goes into his boss's office, He's being shown on the TV in his office, with that shot somehow following him as he moves. But like, n no camera is visible. No cameraman is visible. And also like, why? Why does he need a TV in his office to show him who's in his office? If he can see the TV, then he's in his office. So he can see all this himself. It doesn't make sense. The strangeness and quirks of the show go beyond just thinking, let's do something new, let's do something random. It takes real thought to come up with this stuff, and I just don't understand what sort of thought that is. And if I'm wondering how this is the way it is, I'm also certainly wondering how it got on TV in the first place. It aired at a normal evening time slot on Fuji TV, which often seems to just have pretty standard dramedies or rom-coms. Ryuichi Kimizuka, while having done a decent amount of work, didn't have any series so successful that anything with his name on it gets funded without a second thought. So I think the chances are high that Love Complex was Trojan horsed into Fuji TV, at least a little. There are enough aspects at its forefront that you could focus on when pitching it in order to mask it as a more reliable project to attempt. Firstly, the actual core plot of the embezzlement case isn't too crazy, and around that there are several ways it seems to present itself as a romance show. The name love complex, the general men versus women dynamic of its premise, the very attractive cast, the intro that has these guys bringing roses to all the women while this very melodramatic song is sung by the lead actor. But it isn't a romance show in the slightest. At most, it touches on very messed up versions of love, but ultimately ties way more into the show's general eccentricities rather than actual romantic themes. The show really does seem to just like trolling the audience. Like the first episode is titled Final Episode. Episode nine is titled Part Two, when there is no part one. It doesn't want you to be sure whether it's an intense drama or just completely a sitcom to laugh at. They repeatedly make reference to someone jumping out a window, then immediately show that first clip of Shinyoji doing just that to make you think this is when that happens, only for him to look at the camera and say, The show enjoys rug pulls like that, and it's legitimately one of the strongest pieces to the show's purposeful humor. They'll simply show the guys talking about work, and then switch to a different shot that reveals they're doing so at the urinal. 
where in one episode they have the chef character pouring his heart out, explaining his tragic backstory and how his father taught him to truly respect the fish he cooks. And then the next shot reveals that everyone left. Nobody's listening. From that, it's certainly not out of character for the overall show to be one big rug pull. Present it initially more like a quirky romantic drama that's just a little bit experimental. But then you pan out and see what the hell even is this show? The second episode continues with the widened divide between the boys and the secretaries following Ryuzaki's. Uh, the two of them view Arase as a lead suspect, so are looking into why all the others seem to follow her, and if any of them have specific hatred for men as motivation for stealing from the company. Meanwhile, the secretaries continue to mess with them on any business side quests while also each having their own storylines established. Hiragi, as mentioned before, is in this lady cult, and it's one that believes that all men are demons. The oldest secretary, Sahara, also has distaste for men due to bad history with one she speaks vaguely about. Arase is loved by the other woman simply because she listens to them. She seems to be drawn in by people in distress or pain, and for some reason is living with this out-of-work actor guy. They aren't in a relationship, they aren't related, but they live together and we don't know why. Nono and Renjo are in a relationship, but Renjo is secretly falling for Shinyoji and leaving him notes to help him avoid the secretary's tricks. Minagawa's whole storyline is about body dysmorphia and thinking she's way overweight when she isn't, which I can't speak to if there's anything about this that's inaccurate or the show mishandles, but I am impressed that the show presents it very seriously and essentially as a mental illness, where no matter what other people say, she still thinks, no, I gotta be skinnier, I gotta be skinnier. Like, the only other time I've seen a show prior to 2000 touch on that subject matter is in Seinfeld, when George thought his girlfriend was bulimic. And needless to say, that was totally, completely different. So you're concerned? Elaine, of course I'm concerned. I'm paying for those meals. <laughs> it's a legitimate credit to Love Complex for displaying that seriously with Nina Gawa in 2000. And the last secretary, Shimaki, well, she, she doesn't really have a plot. Uh, she'll pop up here and there, but yeah. Also, this happens in the episode. You get a lot of weird visions from Shinyoji across the series for pretty much no reason. This one I actually thought was maybe important because drawings of that alley and appear throughout the opening, but no, this never shows up again. We're just being fucked with. At most, this one vision is shown to possibly be caused by the lady cult, which Shinyoji and Ryuzaki go on to investigate next in the show after receiving a note pointing towards Hiragi as a suspect. To stop on those dynamics for a second, 4D chess is always being played in that office. Renjo is playing both sides, but is trying to get the boys to know that she's the one who's helping them. They don't realize it even when she's directly giving them the notes, but they're always trying to act like they know more than they do to intimidate the secretaries, but also try to turn them against each other by acting really suspicious and like winking sort of at Sahara all the time to make people think she's the traitor secretary helping them. It's a lot and it's really fun. Of the million things happening in the show, the most vital at this point is Ryuzaki disguising himself as Hiragi, as you do, in order to enter the lady cult and learn that basically everyone is there because they were betrayed by a man previously, and thus all hate men. Hiragi thinks that Shinyoji looks just like her ex-fiance that betrayed her. Nope, we do see that ex-fiance, and they look nothing alike, but whatever. So naturally, Ryuzaki sets it up so she can attempt to strangle Shinyoji to release her anger which then releases an evil spirit from her, I guess. Point is, she's been pulled away from the cult, she loves Ryuzaki now, a bit too much, but she still claims that she didn't do the embezzlement, so she's a spy for the boy's side now, and we move on to the next lead. In the meantime, while Ryuzaki's strongest ties to the secretary is Hiragi, Shinyoji's is, what well, should be Renjo, who's still trying to make him notice her to the detriment of her own relationship, but instead it's Arase. They don't realize it, but they actually met a long time ago at a hospital where his father and her mother died on the same day. And naturally, when you interact once as children, only to not see each other again for many years, you're cosmically connected forever. So at this point, when they have to work overnight at the office, and don't worry, Shinyoji's mother made sure to bring the huge dinner to him, they do grow closer despite being wary of each other, 
even more so when Ryuzaki shows up and takes all the credit for the work they did all night in order to be a common enemy for them and unite them. Which, as another aside, this will happen a lot. Ryuzaki stealing credit from his co-workers is a running gag throughout the series and one of my favorites. Someone else could go on and on to the director about the effort and process of a proposal they made, but then all Ryuzaki has to say is, yeah, all that? That was me. And he gets all the bonus points. There's even a scene where he almost lets one of the secretaries get their due. And the director is just about to shake her hand and thank her, only for Ryuzaki at the last second to reach out, grab his hand, steal that handshake, and backtrack saying actually he did do everything. And it works. The representation of the corporate world is extremely absurd, with the methods of kissing ass ranging from bowing and making small talk with your superior who always ignores you, to yelling, then doing a somersault over to your boss, landing on one knee, and shining their shoes in the hallway. But in a way, while exaggerated and funny, it's also the most accurate representation. How any big business is filled with yes men, kiss asses, and scumbags who lack any real loyalty, think they're way more important than they are, but get away with it because the only people who they cheat out of success are those who already hold less power than them. I wouldn't be surprised if another commentary on these sort of businesses is this continuous thing where everyone seems to go to the work manual for advice, no matter what. I couldn't find details on if this matches up with Japanese work culture, but I figure it has to be pulled from some reality. Like there's a side quest in episode 4 where Arase has to go on a date with his executive son. No, I will not explain this visual. And when Arase and the other secretaries talk about how to avoid sleeping with him, even for something as specific as that, they say to just follow the manual. And this keeps happening. Just look at the manual, look at the manual, look at the manual. No matter how ridiculous the situation is, apparently it has the answer. Okay, fast updates. So now Hiragi is a spy, and Shimagi and Renjo are bribed over to the boy's side as well. Ryuzaki is still seducing other women at work, and there's this one scene where he's basically acting like a vampire with a woman. I don't know if it's her kink or something, but they go back to that in a whole other episode where he basically looks like he's waking up out of a coffin, and they play the vampire music and everything. But like, to be clear, I'm pretty sure he isn't a vampire. So, I, d I don't know. Punchline Minoru, the guy Arase lives with, is cast in a commercial for the company's new printer and becomes a star because who, who wouldn't want your autograph after seeing this? <laughs> Ninagawa works as a hostess to buy more diet pills despite Shinyoji trying to get her to stop taking those, which is also one of the main subplots that highlights Shinyoji's kindness in contrast to Ryuzaki's... You know, despite the two of them often working side by side. Arase has a strange admiration for her father, who she emails and calls often, yet we never hear or see. And in the greatest dramatic crotch related scene since Chainsaw Man, Shinyoji decides he's done working with Ryuzaki. And to prove he's serious, blocks his attempted ball grab for the first time. Now he's going to solve the embezzlement case entirely on his own. At this point, a lot turns inward on Ryuzaki, given he's been pretty terrible to everyone at worst. And at best, maybe he's a scoundrel. While he's turning his evil up to 11 with the intense laugh, Shinyoji, on his own investigation, finds that Nono has spent so much money on gifts for Renjo that she must have stolen money from the company to afford it. So his mom pitches a plan, naturally via their home TV, for him to completely set up Ryuzaki by presenting all this evidence, but saying it's against a different secretary. That way, at the upcoming work party, when Ryuzaki attempts to steal all the credit as per usual, he accuses an innocent person in front of everyone. So Shinyoji can come in, point out the real culprit, and be the hero that everyone celebrates while Ryuzaki is embarrassed and probably fired and or spit on. But just as he's about to fall into that trap and mistakenly accuse Shimaki, something starts coming out of the printers. That whole time, there was an entire other planned attack on Ryuzaki that began when Arase caught on to him promising employees promotions just to sleep with them. She and Ninagawa set up a scheme to gather all the women he's lied to, have them all take pictures with signs exposing him for those actions, and the photos will all be printed out at the same party for all Ryuzaki's superiors to see. And that's what finally gets him. Who Ryuzaki truly is is laid out in front of his boss, his boss's boss, everyone. He tries to play it off as just a shocking stunt he planned to display the shocking quality of this new printer, but it's no use. He's fired, he's out of the show, and now Shinyoji stands alone as the opposition to the secretaries. 
Except that isn't what happens. After Yuzaki's transparent cover-up, suddenly something else comes out of the printer. A picture of him that says, it was all a prank. And just like that, his cover-up is now a success. But don't worry, they're still Shingyoji's plan, except to wait, he's course correcting and slowly turning his finger towards Nono instead. How did he know this? How is he omniscient? How? Okay, well, apparently he overheard Shingyoji talking about his plan in the bathroom, so that explains that. But still, what about the printer? What about the printer thing? How could he have known that? At this point, the secretaries know Hiragi isn't with them, so it's not like they told her, so how? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Hi. Writing this video is really difficult because there are a million things going on in the show, and I'm not sure how to make it all work and fit in a way that isn't just recapping every single beat, because that would take eight hours. So I'll just shove in here a section about one of my favorite aspects of the show that's spread throughout all the episodes, and that's the non sequiturs. A lot of episodes seem to have their own recurring scenes that don't have any connection to the story happening in that episode, even just thematically. We'll see a completely different cheesy drama airing on TV, a photo shoot with all the secretaries, martial arts, whatever. There is one though that seemed really pointless but did end up connecting to the plot. We're in episode 4, we keep cutting to the satellite in space, and it turns out that in this one particular instance where Ryuzaki found where Shingyoji was, he was able to do so because he planted on him a pen created by NASA that sends a signal to the satellite and can give Ryuzaki its exact location. Just such needless over-explaining, especially given the amount of stuff they don't explain in the show and how much Ryuzaki seems to always know. I mean, he usually just appears out of nowhere behind someone or leaps from the ceiling, but for this, he needs NASA's help, like, okay. I almost feel like this was just another thing they used to mess with us by making us think that any of these random clips could end up being slightly relevant even though none of the rest will. Anyways, uh, back to the story. So it looks like Ryuzaki fucking knows everything, and even with everyone hating him, it's practically like his real biggest worry is Hiraki's growing obsession with him. But one thing that finally catches him off guard is that during this party, more money was stolen from the company. Shingyoji's suspicion of Nono was incorrect since she was there the entire time, so who could it have been? Suddenly, Shingyoji and Ryuzaki are back to working together and back at square one. Regrouping, a new plan to get information involves reconnecting director Masakata, the man who hired them, with his old flame, Sahara, who he had a long time affair with in their mid-twenties, something that is hinted at a few times. So that leads to the most sitcom-y point of the series, where the two of them are on a date and both have their allies listening in and watching, either through binoculars or through cameras. The placements of which just don't make sense. Like, sometimes they have a head-on shot, which would mean the camera has to be exactly where the other person is. It just... whatever. But then they do that sitcom thing of taking a call that you pretend is completely unrelated to this, but really you're getting advice on what to do in this current situation. And that just keeps progressing with them each getting a call before every line of dialogue they share with each other, eventually to the point where they're both staring blankly at each other, continuously holding their phone up to their ear for the entire conversation. That isn't even their conversation, it's just Arase and Ryuzaki speaking, basically. But there was a turning point at that dinner when they actually start speaking to each other, and Masukata asks, <laughs> She does still do that thing. She does magic tricks, which I like kind of implies that she brings her props everywhere she goes, but it quickly endears her to him once again, and on a separate date, he goes all in, takes her upstairs, tells her everything about what he's doing and how there was the embezzlement in the company and they're investigating the secretaries, thinking that the two of them are back together and Sahara will work with him and the boys from now on. But no, she won't. Sahara announces she's just going to bring all this information to the secretaries and never wants to be with a director ever again. Could have maybe gotten a hint of that from her holding a totally blank, dead stare from the time they left dinner to now, which I also like to think implies that she maintained that exact expression when they slept together the prior night and he didn't even notice. Regardless though, it means that all the women minus Hiragi are united again, though none of them admit to each other that they stole the money. And with the Sahara lead finished, Shinyoji and Ryuzaki turn their attention back to Arase, with the show also putting a lot of focus on filling in these mysteries about her that we've been sitting with for a while. Like how she's always calling or emailing her father, which seems to be the only time in which she genuinely smiles. It becomes pretty apparent that that guy, he, he's totally dead, and she hasn't accepted that. And the time we saw her so mesmerized by the destroyed building, that happens whenever she sees anything that's mangled or broken. 
The entire reason she lives with Punchline seems to be that she saw him being beaten on the street, and overall is kind of a broken, pathetic man. So psychologically, why she enjoys seeing things broken is that while her father is dead, she never saw the body, she never saw her father be broken, and longs for that sort of closure, I guess. And what does any of this tell us about the embezzlement case? Well, nothing. We're pretty much off that path, and now stuff is just gonna happen. If this whole show really is a rug pull they're playing on us, then while there were many ever so subtle signs from the very start, sometimes people don't notice the aliens, dynamite, and cults until the third or fourth viewing. That was all pretty tame compared to how far off the rails this is going to be. So the near future is when that idea becomes pretty much undeniable. Okay, and then the uh, next GameCube game in my collection is uh, another copy of Pack 2 The Staff of Dreams. Um, it's about as bad as the other three, but you know, it was worth a shot. Punchline, after realizing his place in that situation, decides to leave the apartment. He's a star now, he's on the rise, he needs to become his own man. Big win for him. A uh, not so big win for Ryuzaki when he tells Hiragi that he doesn't want to marry her, and she responds by trying to murder him and Shingyoji, which in turn triggers PTSD that Shingyoji has from his mother being particularly cruel to him as a child and having a very Ivan the Terrible and his son Ivan moment. Hiragi and Ryuzaki completely freeze and are weirded out when Shinyoji has that freak out. And yeah, it was actually due to PTSD, but from their perspective, someone in that moment was still legitimately trying to murder him. His reaction wasn't out of pocket for that situation whatsoever, but wh whatever. That pause gives Hiragi enough time to come to her senses and get over Ryuzaki. Meanwhile, the unhealthy parental issues that Shinyoji and Arase both have are another connector for them with Shinyoji trying to look out for her. And, yeah, your video isn't lagging. This whole scene just is a PowerPoint for some reason. And I actually want to highlight the editing like that more. I've talked about it a bit, but it's still going to be undersold if you don't see the true extent of it. So altogether, without context, here are some of my favorite bizarre edits in the show. They end an episode by having the shot shatter like glass. This zigzag snake zoom technique that I've never seen anywhere else. A shot where everything but Ryuzaki turns black and white. They do the shrinking circle in black space like a Looney Tunes cartoon. Twisty spiral edit. These segments that kind of randomly speed up and slow down, which from watching other J-dramas is maybe the one thing from this that I noticed maybe isn't as unusual in Japanese TV overall. I noticed that like in places where many shows would just have a jump cut going from a cause to an effect, they may just speed up that time in between. So specifically going to times two speed, maybe not that strange, but with it being used just for people walking and it being awkwardly contrasted by these slow-mo shots, still qualifies. There's also a parody of the ER intro that even has a guy narrating the medical situation in English. Her kidney's excretory function is impaired and there are signs of hepatic disorder as well. And a parody of, I think, these moments from 24, but here, like, I mean, Look at this! It's nine different shots of two guys talking on the phone! It looks terrible! There's no way this is done unironically! It, ha it has to be a joke! It has to be a joke! It has to be. It has to be. While Shinyoji is trying to look out for Arase and help her, Ryuzaki aims to break her. So brings her to a baseball stadium because, you know, why not? And shows her her father's death certificate. I love that shot. Let's watch it again. That info KOs her, and with Arase out of commission, Ryuzaki moves in on what his real plan has been this whole time, which he helpfully illustrates via paper dolls of all the characters. Essentially, it's to oust his direct superiors, take control of, and destroy the company. From here, it's like, th this is the Ryuzaki show, and I wholeheartedly support it. For as much as every character in the show is wild and intense, Toshiaki Karasawa absolutely has the most to manage and jump between in performing as Ryuzaki. He has that smarmy businessman vibe, but also can be a Bugs Bunny jester type. Sometimes has these weird needless quirks to how he moves, and of course there's a supervillain aspect to him. This actor has to juggle all of that convincingly, and he does great. It's easily my favorite performance of the series. Only he could be an evil mastermind who plays with and smashes dolls and keeps a doll version of himself in his jacket that somehow remains undamaged in there. It's cinema. Now, there were signs of Ryuzaki being a part of something bigger. Earlier in the series, a congressman recognizes him from something and bows, with Ryuzaki ignoring him. 
He's made some calls to unknown people to set up a plan before. He does this. So now, as part of a bigger plan, he's turning the other executives at the company against his boss, just as he sets that boss up to think he'll be promoted to president. And nothing stands in his way as Shingyoji is busy helping Arase come to terms with the fact that her father is dead, which he almost fully does, but then Punchline suddenly returns, and that, that always felt wrong to me. It just kind of undoes Punchline's development a little, but, you know, we, we can forgive the show for having a single flaw. And Hiragi, not being under Ryuzaki's spell anymore, is only now going against him. Looking into his past, learning that he's worked for plenty of big companies and they all went under within a year of him being hired. And what she also uncovers is that Ryuzaki Go is not his true identity. What he's hidden from all of us is that his true identity is Santa Claus. I'm not kidding. It's Santa Claus. At least I think so. They go too far with this for it to be a joke, I think. Like Ryuzaki's talking to himself in the mirror about how he's Santa and he has these magic powers where he enters people's minds and dances around in his Santa outfit and clown makeup and whispers to their brain essentially to succumb to their deepest, darkest desires. Whether it be letting yourself die, kill someone else, or just get some other form of revenge, with each enticement capped with a Merry Christmas. That's the biggest piece that removes a lot of the secretaries from the equation, gets director Masakata fired from the company, makes another employee create a computer virus that infects all the company's technology, and gets this guy to do something. I don't, I don't know why this happens, this character has never appeared before, but even he gets a Santa vision. The only people who are able to resist these visions are Shinyoji and Hiragi, since they're aware that Ryuzaki is behind them. Furthermore, Hiragi, in an effort to put a stop to him, opts for the most straightforward solution and tries to, uh, kill him. But, uh, he overpowers her and actually just lets her do enough damage to incriminate herself and get arrested while he moves on just fine, making it so at the end of the penultimate episode, there's only one person still standing in the way of Santa Claus. So that leads into the finale, and that seems like the perfect time to recap everything so far. And by recap, I mean recap how the show recaps itself because it doesn't even do that normally. It's often done in this meta way of a character seeing on TV, or on their computer, or in a magazine, all the story dynamics laid out for them, sometimes commenting on how needlessly complex it all is. Even more directly breaking the fourth wall is in the finale, when we have Matsukata come back and say flat out, since my character was fired, I'm not in this episode, but they said I could do the recap at least. Very nice of the show to keep supporting him in his time of need. And the best recap, easily, is when they go so hard at presenting the story like a war in a medieval high fantasy novel, where each character is drawn to fit that aesthetic. Like, I don't know what you call that style, but it's very much in line with the art you'd see on old Lord of the Rings or Earthsea books. And that framework comes back in the middle of the episode to illustrate Renjo defecting from the men back over to the secretaries, as some mysterious voice dramatically narrates that tale. And like many things in the show, this mysterious narrator is used here and never reappears. The show played with its new toy for five minutes before getting bored and moving on to something else. So like, again, this stupid stuff took a lot of thought, or just a lot of stupid, I don't know. But it's clear that there isn't a single piece of the show that's half-assed all the way to the end. Speaking of which... Santa's reign of terror has brought everyone around him to their lowest point. The company is in shambles, their computers are ruined, Hiragi is in jail, Matsukata has to do episode recaps to make ends meet, Ninagawa is in the hospital from taking too many diet pills, Arase is depressed, and Shimaki is... well, she, she's still doing her thing. But over to the right of her, Santa himself is laughing, he's dancing, he's doing... this thing. Yet another company has been destroyed by him, and for all intents and purposes, he won. As more and more people are being infected by the Christmas spirit, all that he leaves is a trail of wreckage for Shinyoji to wander through. And upon wading through it all and reaching the office, having seen all the damage Ryuzaki has done, he tries the only possible solution that remained. Punching him in the face. And punching him over and over again. So they fight. A lot. Like, if you were expecting a normal fight scene. Why? Have you not been paying attention? Love Complex would chop off all of its limbs before it dares to be normal. 
So this fight just goes on and on. And since we're all wondering about it, I did check, and yes, it is longer than the put on the glasses fight from They Live. Measuring from the first hit to the last hit, it takes five minutes and nine seconds in They Live. But in Love Complex, it takes eight minutes and 21 seconds. So heavy win for the latter. And it is a uniquely entertaining fight too. Despite action of any kind not really being a tool on this show's Swiss Army Knife up to this point, it does manage to add it at the last minute here and have it fit with the general frenzied, often contrasting personality of the show. Like, after several minutes of these two guys throwing each other through room after room, there's a point where Ryuzaki gets kicked in the balls and blasts out this absolutely manic scream that's so over the top, matching with the comedic side of his character, but at the same time is genuinely terrifying and kinda demonic, fitting the sinister aspects of him. <laughs> Legitimately, if I had to pick a single moment to sum up the show, that would strangely at least be in consideration. Just the same for putting into perspective how legitimately great Toshiaki Karasawa's performance is. Like, I know I already praised him a bit earlier, but let's put the fight to the side for a second to gush about that more. It's been his show for the last few episodes, and Karasawa really is the single biggest reason that the show works at all. Love Complex actually won a few awards back when it aired, one of which was for that performance. He's always at 100%, and yet regardless of what direction and tone he's putting that huge amount of energy into, or how quickly he has to flip-flop between them, it's engaging, still feels like the same character, and works as an effective main driver of the plot. All the way from the point where he's just that scummy businessman, to when he's the evil, murderous Joker slash Santa Claus. And I do wonder how many takes some of this stuff took, because he more than anyone else has to keep a straight face while doing the strangest actions or poses. I want the behind-the-scenes documentary on this. I wouldn't even be surprised if he actually did get kicked in the balls there, you know? He, he seems like a committed actor. And okay, looks like the fight is ending, so let's go back to that. After a long, exhausting battle, Shinyoji, filled with pure rage, desperately chokes the life out of Ryuzaki. Only for, after a few brief moments of peace, his eyes to still pop back open after it all. There's no end to this guy, so since even that didn't work, it meant Shinyoji had to use his last resort to solve this problem once and for all by passionately kissing Ryuzaki. Except that isn't what- Oh wait, no, that's, that's exactly what happened. So what I've had to have explained to me is that this isn't just due to their burning sexual tension. If you look at the scene where Ryuzaki's eyes pop back open, his eyes are blue there. But for the entire series up to that point, his eyes were brown. Upon seeing that change, Shinyoji says, <laughs> They kiss, and now Shinyoji's eyes are blue, Why Ryuzaki's are not. This is because the real Ryuzaki is just the child of a congressman and his mistress. He's just some guy who has been controlled and swayed by a demon, as we can see a hint of in that first Santa conversation where he's talking to himself as if what he's doing is for the greater good, saying he's actually saving the secretaries and all that. I assume that this internal dialogue is kind of that demon manipulating the real Ryuzaki. We can now see that this person we've been dealing with for 11 episodes is essentially the devil. If only there was some way we could have known earlier. But the demon only showed itself through those eyes when Ryuzaki was near death, which Shinyoji immediately recognized and decided to take care of himself. How he knew that trading it through the mouth was the way to go, I'm not sure, but it's as good a guess as anything, I suppose. And this means the demon is now inside Shinyoji. Ryuzaki, finally free from it, lets out one tear before falling to the ground. And Shinyoji, fighting off the demon in him, tells Arase to stay away. Oh yeah, Arase's here now, she showed up during the fight. And he throws himself out of the window to take the demon down with him. Now, not to be a downer, but think about it, it doesn't really make sense to me why he did this. Like, it seems like if he dies with the demon inside him, then the demon dies too. But it seems like Ryuzaki died anyways. He did basically kill him from the strangling, right? I mean, we go on to see all the happy endings for the secretaries. Arase getting over her father issues. Ninagawa is going to counseling. Nono and Shimaki are in love now, I, I guess. But no sign of Ryuzaki, so he's probably dead. And if he was gonna die, then doesn't that mean the demon would die too? So why did Shinyoji need to take the demon and die? You're just adding extra steps, unless the only effective method against demons in this universe is plummeting to the ground? Or I guess there is some talk late in the series hinting that Shinyoji and Ryuzaki are essentially opposites, or two sides of the same coin? 
So if Shingoji is an angel, Ryuzaki's devil, then hypothetically maybe they have to die together? I don't know, but whatever, you know, let's not take away from Shingoji's big moment. He saves the day, yay, woo, go Shingoji. And then, that, that, that's it. That's Love Complex. There's no big thesis statement or conclusion woven throughout this, it's just a really fun, weird show that could have been lost to time to most of the world, and everyone should eventually make whatever weird thing is in their head. Your bow is afraid, your insert Tom Waits album here, mostly for yourself, because it's highly possible it won't work in the slightest, but also, at the very least, whoever does see it will remember it, and maybe, despite all logic, it'll actually get some attention and then years later a self-described crazy person will translate it and do everything in their power to share and allow others to witness the enigma in all its glory. Because we're still not done. Even if you got this far, I highly recommend watching all of Love Complex for yourself, probably with friends. My friend and I actually made bingo boards to mark as we watched each episode, and like, you can make it fun for the whole family, you know? Just search for it, it won't be hard to find, there's just so much here. In trying to crunch down the entire plot for this video, I wrote notes for every episode, then had to take notes of those notes, which I then still had to trim some info from to turn into something manageable. It's impossibly dense, and there are so many little moments that didn't fit the rest of the script, but I just have to acknowledge in some way. Like I can't not bring up how the people at the electronics company apparently do an eyes wide shut poker party once in a while, or that there's this one seemingly throwaway scene where Ryuzaki is trying to pull Shinyoji back to his side, so he's saying, Oh, I need your help, I can't type on a computer. And he's typing, not even like incorrect Japanese or something, just complete gibberish. And I guess he was being truthful here because the show actually stays consistent with that. You see him later using a computer and it's again gibberish. And he tells someone that he lies on his resume and inflates the words per minute he can type to impress people. I just like that they maintain that pointless character quirk. Also, when they explain Ninagawa's backstory, it's all shown via black and white drawings. Like they aren't even animated. They're just filming these physical, static pictures. There's a short Blair Witch parody because it's the year 2000, of course there is. This one shot of Santa Ryuzaki for whatever reason feels exactly like the taunt animation you'd see when this character enters the stage in a fighting game. Yeah! During the final recap, they just flat out use the Indiana Jones theme music. There's a whole minute and a half stretch where two voices are commentating at the goings on at a work party, like they're sports announcers doing a play by play. At one point, we see Ryuzaki hitting golf balls off the roof into the city, which is already ridiculous and dangerous enough, but then the next shot shows that the roof actually has a net specifically for practicing golf shots safely, meaning that he just actively chose to ignore that and instead potentially kill innocent people with golf balls. No other show is doing that. If that's not a masterpiece, nothing is. Oh, also Hiragi was the one who embezzled all the money.